um, helps to govern the SBIR program, and they designate one of these centers in 30 different states, and Illinois is one of them. So we provide free resources like the training that we're going to have today, many other training events that you can log into online or see past events. We also provide one-on-one -on -one counseling. So if any of you want technical assistance, help thinking about solicitations, Annalisa is one of the best in, in the country at helping people with SBIR applications, and she's doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one work as well. But we're really happy to be here at Portal today as one of the leading locations for life sciences in the city of Chicago and having a real impact of being able to provide not only the world-class facilities that we're in today, but also support for entrepreneurs as their business development needs continue to grow and hopefully, hopefully coalescing more of the companies that are here in the medical and bio medical space as well. So thank you, EJ. And I'll come back to introduce Annalisa again. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is EJ Reedy. I'm Director of Platform and Ecosystem here at Portal Innovations. So Portal Innovations is a venture capital firm that also invests in cutting edge life science, wet lab, dry lab, um, and other space to enable the entrepreneurial environment. So Annalisa and Reyes are Portal members. They're also in our uh, core portfolio, um, having received an investment. And so we're part of the revolution that's kind of happening here in Illinois and in Chicago that's helping to broaden the ability of companies to grow and to stay um, near where they've uh, been birthed. So we're working right now with, I think, uh, eight companies that have emerged out of Northwestern, two out of uh, University of Chicago, a number from UIC, um, UIUC, et cetera. So just excited to be working. We've got 50,000 square feet in the heart of um, Fulton Labs or Fulton Market here in Chicago. So if you're with us online or you're here in person, feel free to stop by um, and see us at, at any point. Um, so we have a huge number of events throughout the summer that are convening the life sciences space. As well, I would give a, a, a uh, you know shout out to podcasts that we have. Uh, so Lab Rats to Unicorns is an ongoing podcast that we have with our founder, John Flavin, which is interviewing and kind of helping to um, make the career paths um, open um, for folks that are going from the lab to the boardroom and trying to launch um, life sciences companies. So new podcast out today. Um, so check us out on all the different, um, you know, downloadable platforms um, and just stay connected. So just so thankful for the group that's come together today. Um, all the panelists, Annalisa for helping to wrangle and figure out you know, what makes sense and how to keep an eye on uh, supporting all of our entrepreneurs. And so let us know if you've got any questions on otherwise, I'll turn it back to Laura. Thank you. Thank you. And so thank you also to UIC to be one of the partners in this four part series. There is one more coming up. So if you want more information, please attend the next one as well. And with that, I'd like to introduce Annalisa um, Samara. She has been working with us for a long time. Um, I first knew her in the context of her work with Illinois Venture. She has worked in venture capital. She has supported numerous life sciences companies, especially medical device companies is one of her areas of expertise. If you've seen her in Chicago, it's because she's everywhere. She assists companies from Polsky to Matter to UIC to Argonne National Labs Northwestern, our Illinois University Incubator Network throughout the state of Illinois through the University of Illinois. So she has touched many companies and importantly, she's helped many of them successfully obtain funding. So she is CEO, as you heard of Rayos, which is based here at Portal as well. So she has the practical experience of running a company, being a PI, and securing funding across many of the different companies she's touched. So please join me in welcoming Annalisa Samara. Wow, thank you so much, Laura, uh, for that in introduction. Um, and, you know, Portal, um, University of Illinois Fast Center, and um, World Business Chicago for, you know, uh, helping to organize um, this event. So thank you so much for carving out uh, this late morning, early afternoon. I'm not sure what hour it is. Um, but, um, you know, with us um, to talk about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. And that's you know SBIR funding. Um, so this is the third part of a you know four-part series um, that we have going on. Um, you know the previous uh, you know talks that I gave you know focus on kind of like general SBIR 101. Then we went into fund budgets and accounting, and then you know for this one I thought you know what let's bring on some winners. Let's bring in some uh, you know some folks that I know that are brought in, brought in multi-million dollar grants. Um, so these are, you know, some friends of mine, um, but before we, we kind of go into the, the panel, um, I'm going to go just briefly um, over on SBARs until you know, um, 
So just really briefly, and then we'll do, you know, introductions, um, you know, uh, on the panel. So, so um, just kind of like, you know, just general background in SBAR. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so for those of you who don't know what SBIRs are, um, so, you know, these are, SBIR stands for Small Business Innovation Research or Small, Small Business Technology Transfer in the case of SCTR. It's set aside funding uh, by the government specifically for small businesses, for new products, innovative technologies, that sort of thing. Uh, next slide. Um, and um, really it's to stimulate innovation um, to further R&D and basically to get really cool technologies out into the marketplace to benefit the American people. Uh, next slide. Um, so here's a slide on a number of agencies that participate, um, you know, in, in this great program for small businesses. Um, you have the, you know, DOD Department of Defense to, you know, NIH and NSF. Um, you know, there's some recipients here of those particular uh, grant opportunities. Uh, next slide. And here's a slide that I stole from my friends over at the FAST Center. This is just kind of where Illinois ranks in terms of awards uh, to small companies. So, you know, we, this, you know, it's definitely been growing. This is something that I've been a part of, you know, the SBAR since 2008. Um, so, you know, every year Illinois just gets better and better. And I think through programs like this, through word of mouth, through, you know, more innovation coming out of the universities, um, you know, um, people are going to stop saying, you know, uh, you know, you know, why can't we catch up to, to the coast where it's going to be, well, why can't the coast catch up to Chicago? So, um, you know, hopefully for, for the folks um, at home and here who are, you know, thinking of applying, um, hopefully you can definitely, you know, add to this metric. So... I think that might be it in terms of slides. I'm not going to go into more SBR one on one. I want to, you know, kind of showcase the rock stars um, that you know I brought into you know this panel. So maybe we can do some introductions. Um, and these are again folks that have brought in some massive grants. So um, if you guys can just um, introduce yourselves um, and tell us a little about about your background, your company and then the SBR grants that you won. So, um, you know, joining us, you know, here live, um, you know, we have Adil Akhtar from Psionic, right here. Uh, Dr. Shadis, oh, and he's also a yeah, doctor, also PhD. Uh, Dr. Shadis Shukair, um, Director of Clinical and Translational Research at Brightseed, and Chuck Ventura, co-founder and CEO of Hemotech Medical. So let's just uh, kind of do some introductions, starting with you, Adil. Thank you, Annalisa. And so I'm Adil Akhtar, I'm the CEO and founder of Psionic, and we develop advanced bionic limbs that are affordable and accessible for everyone. And so with me, I have the ability hand right over here. And so this is meant for people who have actually lost their hand. And our first patient in the US was a retired US Army sergeant who lost his hand in Iraq in 2005 due to roadside bomb, used a hook on a daily basis, and we wanted to upgrade him to the 21st century. And um, this, is, this hand is the first one on the market to give users touch feedback. So when he actually holds his daughter's hand, he can feel it. There's no other hand on the market that can um, actually do that. And so this was um, developed um, while I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and then we were incubated through uh, Enterprise Works. And while we were at Enterprise Works, we started applying for our first um, SBIR grants. And um, this was in, uh, with the help of the Technology Entrepreneurship Center at the University of Illinois, and, um, Jed Taylor, and, and a lot of those folks who helped us put together um, those initial grants that, uh, that we ended up winning. And so we've gotten Two, um, two phase ones and two phase twos to follow on the, uh, that from the National Science Foundation for a total of uh, two, I think it was like, like 2.4 million or something like that uh, uh, when it all totals. And then there's still follow on funding that we can get from that from supplemental grants awards. So there's an additional million from those just coming up in the next year or so. Um, and the Ability Hand has been um, out to market um, over the last couple of years. It's available nationwide, covered by Medicare and FDA registered um, in the U.S. So anyone across the entire U.S. is able to get uh, a Bionic Hand. Wow, very inspiring. Um, and congratulations on all you know, the success so far. I, so I see a deal all the time on LinkedIn. I don't know if you know, it's like all over the place and, you know, you, you know doing is it, you know, really cool technology, you know, really, uh, you know, advancing the Bible. We have to have them on this panel, so, so glad that you're here. Um, you know, another big winner uh, on the SBR front is, you know, a friend of mine. Uh, so, uh, you know, Dr. Shadda Shukir, so if you do mind a little bit about yourself and your company. Absolutely. Um, so I'm the, the director of clinical and translational sciences at uh, Brightseed. And what Brightseed is, is a surgical technology company that came about um, out of a clinical need during minimally invasive surgery. And so um, as surgery has gone sort of smaller and, and less invasive, 
Um, it's brought, it brought a lot of really good advantages for patients, you know, a lot of uh, shorter lengths of hospital stay, um, less risk of surgical infection, that, that sort of thing. Um, and so what, what it has uh, not done, however, is uh, allowed for surgeons to still be able to sort of visualize and um, palpate for very important structures in the body during these surgeries. And so what BrightSeeds technology does is um, integrate into surgical tools and use hyperspectral imaging in order to actually uh, give information about what, what uh, tissues are being encountered during the surgery, um, whether there's a critical structure within the tissue. So it's a blood vessel, a nerve, a ureter, and it really helps prevent things like um, uh, intraoperative adverse events and helps make surgeries in general more efficient of, you know, sort of targeting what you're looking for and avoiding what you're not uh, trying to uh, encounter, hopefully. Um, and so um, I came to Bright Seed after my PhD at Northwestern in life and medical sciences, uh, where I studied something a little bit different than surgery, but overall it was uh, still the idea of translating something from the lab to the OR or bedside. And so, um, so I'm really sort of proud and uh, excited about what Bright Seed's doing. And we've been able to secure, uh, you know, since, since our founding, um, almost $3 million in uh, SBIR funding from both NIH and NSF. And it's made a big difference to help propel the technology forward and make sure that it's, um, you know, really solid and it's, it's working towards uh, sort of the, the end use, which is the clinical utility in surgery. And, and, um, and I'll hopefully share a lot about our experiences with the SBIRs today. Great. Thank you, Shada. Yeah, Bright Seeds technology is just so cool. Um, I mean, I think you guys are just going to move mountains in the surgical suite, and I, I love watching you guys grow. Great. Uh, Chuck? Yeah, my name is Chuck Ventura, and um, I just say I am the uh, co-founder of Hemotech Medical. We're a medical device startup, and I personally love SBIR grants. Um, I have a, a lot of passion for them and, and really do love them because um, they really helped me um, springboard into entrepreneurship. So um, my, um, by training my undergrads in biomedical engineering and electrical engineering, I have a master's in mechanical and aerospace engineering. And I have a little over 15 years experience in the medical device and pharmaceutical space. Um, I've always uh, been interested in entrepreneurship, and actually that's why I went to engineering school. It was one of my passions, uh, but I worked at bigger companies right out of college. So I started my career at Baxter Healthcare, uh, then I went over to Hospira, then I was over at Pfizer in Lake Forest, uh, worked my way up to like a little engineering manager position, um, um, had a team in R&D, and um, along the way, um, I, we founded this company, Hemotech Medical, to um, solve an unmet need in the dialysis space. And uh, just tell you a little bit about that unmet need. Um, is anybody familiar with hemodialysis? Dialysis in general. So basically, your kidneys, we have our kidneys to filter our blood, right? If you have end-stage renal disease, then um, you need to go on dialysis, basically. And, and your blood gets pulled out of your body and gets filtered and sent back to your body. Um, and it's patients, there's actually 500,000 patients um, in the US. They have to go three times a week, 52 weeks a year. So that's 50 million, five zero, 50 million dialysis sessions um, go on every year with, um, in the US. And it's, it's an amazing therapy, but what we couldn't believe is that once in a while, these needles get dislodged from patients' arms and the machine, instead of pumping the blood back into the body, um, actually we'll pump it on the floor and there's, um, there's patient deaths and serious adverse events. Um, so, um, that's an unmet need in the, um, dialysis space that no one was really doing much about. And one of my co-founders, when he was doing his residency, he saw that problem. And, um, we, um, we basically created a company around solving that problem. Um, we developed the patents and the IP and, um, and, and interestingly, well, how we got started was through the SBIR grants, because uh, our co-founder, he used to be a professor at UIC, he was a tenured professor at UIC. Um, so we had this um, patent, we had this idea and this company, and um, I was busy working like at, at a bigger company at the time. And um, our co-founder said, um, hey, why don't we just try an SBIR grant? And we, we did a phase one, 
And uh, we got that award and that allowed us to prove the feasibility. So since then, we did a phase two for, and for about 1.5 million, then a phase two B for 3 million. So we've raised a total of 4.7 million. And then uh, we've took the company to a, a commercial deal um, for a, a joint development exclusive licensing deal. So, and that all, if it wasn't for SBIR, um, I, we would never, we've never have done it. So I'm excited to be here and to uh, share some of our experiences. Thank you for sharing that, Chuck. I think that's why we're all here, right? Because, you know, SBIRs have such, made such a, you know, significant impact in each of our companies, right? Um, so, um, you know, so glad that you guys can share stories. But, you know, with that, you know, I'd love to now kind of just probe into your minds and see, you know, you know, how you guys got so successful with SBIRs. They're not easy to do. They're really not. So, um, you know, maybe we can start with kind of like, you know, now that, you know, you know, go back in time to when you were, you know, uh, decided that, hey, I'm going to do this application. How did you actually mobilize your team? Was it just yourself? You and a co-founder, you and a friend you paid, like who was it? So we'll start with you, Adil. How did you, what did you do like in terms of forming the team? Yeah, so because, uh, because uh, you know, the origins of Psyonic were while I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, um, I had a team that I was working with uh, to build like very early prototypes uh, of the ability pan. And um, we were, I mean, we had been publishing papers, we'd been getting a lot of uh, uh, like press and attention um, just starting to generate at, at that point in time. And um, we, as I was mentioning earlier that um, through the University of Illinois, through the Technology Entrepreneurship Center, they had workshops on, that were very similar to this, where we would learn exactly how to put together a, a successful winning uh, SBIR proposal. And that was immensely helpful, like especially when we started drafting and then we would we would send the draft to the, the Technology Entrepreneurship Center and then they'd be like, this is absolute garbage. You need to like rewrite this entire thing. Like this section, they're going to like destroy you on, on this. You, you're, you know, you're, you're helpful, exact right? oh, okay. 100%. Otherwise we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have gotten the award, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and these were, these were seasoned veterans, right? These were one, uh, people who served on review panels who knew the program directors, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that that feedback was uh, immensely helpful in, in us winning those initial awards, um, especially for us uh, at the time who didn't had no idea how to write these grants, yeah, right? Absolutely. absolutely. Now, that show that you know you have such a you know strong academic background. Was it easy for you to just jump to the SBRs and kind of like form the team? Did you, did you just do it, or how did that come about? That's a great question. So in my in my lab uh, beforehand, I had never really been involved in like every aspect of a grant and writing the grant. I'd really been involved in maybe reviewing or like writing small sections of the technology, um, you know, science part of it. And um, and so getting to Brightseed, um, we did have and I think our first sort of intro to SBIRs was um, I believe an iBio uh, seminar as well, something like that, where they were they were talking about it and then. We tried to sort of slap something together, and thankfully, then um, Annalisa came along <laughs> and and, uh, and and was uh, kind enough to um, to help support our, our you know actually getting everything together. But we have a uh, uh, at that point we had four full time employees. It was a really small company. We were trying to like do research and also then get this thing together, which in and of itself is is kind of a full time. You know, you really spend a lot of time putting this thing together to make sure that you're getting everything in there and and um, and getting all the components correctly, you know, uh, gathered. And so, um, so I think what we did was we tried to break it into sort of the businessy side of things and then the technology side. And so coming from an academic back background, writing the research strategy was actually pretty not, you know, it was a smooth transition, I would say. Um, and then now that we've gone through, um, different rounds of grant writing, I think I've been exposed to basically every piece of the, the grant um, submission itself and actually submitting the grant is its own um, sort of beast that you have to you have to really understand and and um, go through a few times before you're, you're good at it. Um, but I do think it was it was definitely helpful to have that background and it's helpful to have team members who um, you know go in and, and kind of scrap together their parts and then you put it all together and at the end of the day it has to be a really cohesive sort of um, you know uh, non patchworky application that you send in and that that um, highlights what you're trying to do and how you, how this will further the, the SPIR would further the technology so so I think that's I don't know if that answers it but <laughs> I do think perfect. it helps it's yeah perfect. Perfect. 
And then, and then Chuck, you know, you know, she said at the time when she applied, you know, there's there's four team members, and with you is you and your other, you know, your co-founder, while you guys are also doing stuff in the lab. So how did you guys do it? I mean, how did did you just divide up the grant, or what did you do? Yeah, we were. Um, yeah, for 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 me, I was. We're definitely a little. We're spoiled because our co-founder, uh, Dr. Patrick Roche, he um, he was a tenured professor, so he spent his whole career writing grants. Um, and then he was already doing um, SBIR grant consulting for other companies. So we, you know, we were, we were very spoiled in that regards. But the, as far as like mobilizing our team, um, Patrick would, um, he would work on a lot of like the first draft. And then um, my other co-founder, Dr. Peter Tech and myself, we would divvy up sections, right? And we write our sections. And then Patrick would really, you know, kind of integrate it together. Um, over time, I've learned through him. Um, but then from a process standpoint, one thing we've always done is, um, as far as like with our mobilizing the full team is we, we bring in, even though Dr. Patrick Roche is a grant writing expert, we still bring in other grant writing experts to do independent reviews. So um, in getting them on board, integrate it with the team. Um, so even when you think it's, and I think even Annalisa, we may even have had you early on read one of ours. So, hey, we think it's like good and ready for prime time we still let someone like independent read it and then, and then give the feedback. Um, so I guess for the, for the folks at home who would like to get like the independent review, how did you find someone like that to, that you yeah, trusted going, to look at your grant? Yeah, going, just kind of going um, through our network. I know um, on, on my end, um, right. Someone referred us, I think to you at the time. Um, and then, um, but you know, other than that, you know, maybe you have to go like on LinkedIn or, whatnot and try to build some relationships but yeah you definitely want to find um you know and i definitely definitely want to find somebody that's done it before because even to your point like some just submitting the grant alone is is um it's not necessarily difficult but you have to understand how to do it there's a lot of nuances yeah. so you need to put together that that team to um that has you know experience at least one person has to have experience doing it um, you know, I think when people think of the, you know, these, these grants, um, they're beasts, right? You know, these are huge applications. Um, they think about, uh, you know, the research plan and the project description in the case of, the, you know, the NSF and the commercialization plan when you get to the phase two level. But, you know, sometimes one thing that's overlooked are letters of support. So I was wondering, you know, for you guys, like, uh, deal, how important were letters of support for, for your company when you got your, you know, your multiple grants? And who did you get letters from? And how did you decide? Because I know with the NSF, you're limited, right, to a number of letters. So, you know, who are the folks that you talk to? Yeah, and so um, our, our letters of support were pretty critical in making that happen, um, especially because, you know, starting out as a small team, there's there's going to be gaps, right? That like, you, you might not have, like, a full C-suite at the time, a board of directors, right? You're very early stage, and the whole point of the NSF, or like the SBIR phase ones, are to test feasibility of, of uh, whether your product or idea could be even be viable, right? And so you kind of want to pick those letters of support that that kind of fill in those gaps, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, what we would have is we would have clinicians that we would work with that were testing out earlier our earlier prototypes on patients that could be like, you know, if this if this um, phase one is successful and they're able to actually make this, I would I would be a, a purchaser of their their product, right? And that, in the eyes of reviewers, that's exactly what they want. That's the whole point is to commercialize this technology that was coming out of the lab. Um, another thing that was um, really helpful was to get um, early investors um, to write a letter of support as well, because um, then they know that you know you're not solely relying just on grant funding, but there's actual market interest um, in this. So uh, having investors and having potential like clients, those were the, the the letters of support that really made a difference for us. Great, great, great. And you know, you know, Shada, with with your clinical uh, you know uh, product, I know that you you guys got a number of letters of support too, letters of support too. But um, I guess. Are there other letters that you've gotten? Uh... Um, so I would say, in addition to the ones that Dale mentioned, I would uh, say um, potential strategic partners. So you know, our our technology is um, you know potentially able to be integrated into multiple different existing uh, surgical companies' tools. So so we were able to talk to uh, representatives from these various companies and get them to write. Uh, letters to the effect of, you know, this is something that they're interested in, this is a clinical need, or this is a market um, opportunity. So both of those uh, highlight 
uh, the same things that the surgeon letters do. Um, I think getting letters from your um, Anyone that's sort of involved in the grant that's not a full-time employee, I think it's helpful to have those letters of uh, commitment. Um, and so I think those are the only things I could think of maybe that are in addition. Yeah. Similar letters? Yeah, the only other, uh, no, those are all like really good ones. Um, the only other one that we started integrating more, I don't, I think we've always done it too, is, um, uh, and I don't know how many, I don't know what the limit, we've done NIH. So what's the limit with NI NSF? Uh, well, three for yeah. phase one, and I think it's five for phase two. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's tricky. So, um, yeah, we probably get around that many anyways. But the um, the one that we integrated the last couple of times was from a patient. So, and I think too, like, I know at least the NIH, they are getting more like patient-centric, right? They want that patient-centric. So having something from a patient, at least in our case, I think is good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And for yours, it would probably be great, right? <laughs> the, yeah. The patient. Yeah. Right? yeah. Now, I, and I guess uh, back to kind of thinking in, in terms of kind of strategizing your application. It's, do you, have you did you contact your program director in advance of the application, or did you just submit it? And if you did contact him or her, what did you say? Yeah. So originally, when we when we did our very first one, yeah. we, we had done it. Um, now the, the tricky thing for us is that our program director has changed about four times uh, right. among the the process. So it's it's it it's it's bounced yeah, yeah it's bounced around quite a bit. Um, but when we did contact them, you know, it was it was more like a, an introduction to just like you know this is the this is the time kind of technology yeah. we're building and just to get to know each other, not necessarily yeah. like. Um, like like an ask per se but just so that you know put, put us on their radar that that you know this is cool technology that's coming out of the university of illinois and and uh, that you know we might be interested in in um, submitting an sbar soon um, and i know with respect to i mean if we're talking about the difference between like nsf and nih the program directors um, have a lot more um, influence on the um, on the process of, of getting sbrs through um, in NSF as opposed to uh, an NIH in particular. And so um, it's, it's helpful to get to know the, the program director um, the, yeah. in, in those cases. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, Nashada, I mean, you, you guys have gotten both NSF and NIH grants, you know, multiple ones. So, you know, how frequently did you talk with your program officer? What was that relationship like? Yeah, how do you keep them happy? That's a good question. So um, as, uh, as mentioned, the NSF program director. I know we had um, a very sort of open line of communication. Um, in fact, at one point, our CEO, um, you know, they were, there was going to be like an intro call, and then he was in the area um, where NSF is, where the office was. And so he just kind of said, can I just come by in person and introduce myself and the company? And, um, and it was great. And it was a really good way to, um, to really introduce the technology to the NSF program director and um, and I know uh, we did have like one change in, in program director there. And so keeping up with, you know, making sure that they know there's visibility of the company and, and they understand what the technology is and where you are and progress that's being made. Um, for the NIH, um, it's just as important, I think, to have an open line of communication. Um, while they don't, the program officer there doesn't have any sort of impact on the, um, the review or the study section or anything like that, it's more, um, they're, they've been a, a great resource and a great um, sort of ally just in understanding the process. And, and, you know, we were thinking about, you know, after phase two, what are our options and being able to have a conversation and understand the differences between some of the options. Um, also, um, we've had uh, the ability to break down some of the reviews and just understand, you know, because they're in the room with when the reviews are happening. And so if there was anything that's sort of not communicated on paper, they're happy to, um, you know, to, to fill in anything there if there is anything. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I think there's definitely a big upside to just being able to openly communicate with the program officer or program director. Both. Yeah. And Chuck, your, you know, your program officer was essentially with you from the very start yeah. and now to, you know, the finish line. So I, I, I guess what kind of, like how often have, did you talk with him or her and like what kind of support has- Yeah, you know, no, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we've been fortunate to have the same one. For all, for all this time. So I think in the beginning, it, it's just more of like making sure we're submitting it to the right division, right? So maybe some small interaction there. Um, for the phase two, I think it was maybe, again, just some check-ins, making sure like 
right, you know, right place and all that. But I know with the phase two B before we did that, there was a, a lot of discussions. Um, I know we were just talking about that CRP. There's something called a commercialization readiness grant um, after phase two. So especially once you start getting that, it's good to develop the relationship, I think, early in the beginning, because I especially as you get into these bigger ones, you know, you, you may want to get feedback on which one you should be going for. Like we were trying to decide between this commercialization readiness or the phase two B and what's the order. So we decided to do the phase two B for the clinical study. Um, and then we actually submitted a CRP um, after. So um, yeah, so just like basically working, you know, getting input before we make some big, big moves. And, um, and then occasionally if there's like a budget change or there's some, some things like that, but we're trying to be careful too on how you don't want to bother you don't want to make too much noise. You don't be annoying, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, sp speaking of changes, and this is a question for anyone on the panel, you know, uh, one thing about science is that, um, you know, things don't always go as planned, right? Uh, you know, during the research, that sort of thing. So for any of you, like during the duration of your SBI research project, have you had to pivot, change any objectives or specific aims? And I guess, how did you communicate that? If you did, how did you communicate that with your program officer or program director? So to anyone, if any of your research has changed. Sure, so I'll take this because it's relatively recent. Um, but for our NIH phase two grant, we had a pretty big shift in, um, in our tech development. We, um, you know, we were initially gonna use like a contrast agent and we were gonna go this one route and then we had to change basically an entire aim. Um, and we were nervous about contacting the, the program officer. And it turned out to be very, again, probably having an established relationship with them was really helpful, but we were able to communicate exactly why and then how it wouldn't change, you know, it changed, didn't change our timeline at all or our budget. It just changed sort of the, where, where things were allocated within the budget, but not necessarily um, you know, the end goal. Um, and so I think that was the important part. And once we communicated that, she, you know, it was really reasonable and we were able to write a letter to amend, you know, uh, those changes when we entered our next progress report. So it was really um, a lot more, uh, a lot less or not less stressful, scary. not as scary as we thought it was gonna be, but it was really helpful to have that ability to talk to the yeah. PO, yeah. Dealer check, did you guys have any changes during your research uh, at all? We, I mean, we've had some, yeah, where like the, um, like a, sp a specific aim or um, the, I know with the budget, I don't know, his budget fall in the loop too. So yeah, with budget, there was some, there was a, there was a, a budget change that we had to make. So it was a si similar situation, right? We get, you get kind of nervous and how do you bring it up? How do you say it? But you just have to, um, as long as you prepare right a logical explanation um, and and show that you're not you know we're not impacting overall research goals, uh, they're usually very receptive to it. Yeah, you know, I think that's I would have to agree with that. You know, uh, you know, we had uh, you know some changes in our grants too. Where at first uh, I was afraid to talk to Berger, like like I was going to get in trouble. You know that I did something wrong and that the money wouldn't flow in and then I have to break the news to my team and then and then there's this you know whole domino effect of sadness right but you know like you said you know I think they're kind of this isn't news to them right so I mean you know this is science you know things change they don't always go as planned it's like it's like it's like pro formas too right you know your financial those are projections right so yeah, did you did you have any changes at all? Uh, so we didn't have any major changes, but you know the thing is you're writing this like you know a, a, at least like a year in advance from right. when you actually are, are like yeah. doing a lot of the, the tests. I mean, you, you might be doing them at the same time, but obviously science and research changes right. at the time, right? So the the overall we didn't have to change any aims, but perhaps like the, the metrics that we used to measure whether we were doing something right was completely wrong, like right. the, the first time. And so um, we would just, in our interim reports, we would just mention that, like, we, and explain why the, the last one was, was the, the wrong metric to use and why this one is the correct one. And we haven't had any issues with our program directors really say, saying good. anything. Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay. So folks, if you're worried about, you know, things changing in your, uh, you know, grant, um, this note from the four of us, so, you know, you have four data points here that, you know, it's going to be okay. Um, so, you know, I want to kind of shift gears now in terms and talk about uh, bringing in more money 
into the company. So, um, you know, for anyone on the panel, just talk about like kind of how this grant fit into your overall fundraising path and kind of what reception you got from, you know, potential or current investors. So. <laughs> yeah, for us, it was, it was all positive. So we, um, I think that that helped a lot is when we would talk with investors or um, like the co-development partners, I, I, they, they actually, for us, they, for our technology, they, they really liked it. So, um, and then our, our specific aims did fit pretty well within the commercialization strategy. So it was, um, it was a real positive, it's, it's been a very positive um, benefit for the, um, for funding. Yeah, and I would say uh, I'd add to that, you know, it's, it's been a, um, when investors, uh, at least we've, we've so far only raised seed funding and we've done a lot with, uh, I think $9 million to date and one third of that is non-dilutive funding. And so, um, so you know, the, the SBIR grants are really important, but you can't sustain a company just on that funding because there's only um, so much you can do, uh, you know, that with that funding, there's, uh, limitations on the types of activities. Um, there's also gaps between phases. So if you're doing a phase one to, you know, finish proving out feasibility, and then you have to apply for the phase two after that, you have a bit of a gap. And so understanding sort of how to talk to um, investors and and a lot of them that know about the SBIR process, like that it's a that it's non-dilutive, <laughs> b that it's um, uh, you know, a vetting process. There's a whole uh, you know, review process. And, and so it's one more step of or one more layer of vetting. Um, and then uh, additionally to that, we have, um, I think we've heard from even strategic partners that, that that's the case. And so they look at it with a little more confidence once they know it's been through the whole SBIR application process and has been awarded uh, these different um, grants. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I will say that uh, my investors love the non-dilutive. They love it because it's not their money, right? Uh, well, technically it is because it's taxpayer dollars, just so we're clear, right? So it is their money. Um, but they love it because, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not using their, you know, dilutive capital. It's de-risking maybe some other projects you're working on. Um, but you have to fit this puzzle, this piece in like your fundraising story, right? So how do you do it? How do you, how do you, how do you do that? Um, yeah, so it, it, interestingly for us, um, when we first um, submitted our first SBIR grant, it was, it was essentially what, the, it, what we were doing, right? It was everything that we were doing. It wasn't like we were a big company or a bigger company that had like side projects going on and things like that, right? And um, I, I usually tell this story where um, in, it was like the, the end of the summer of uh, uh, 2017 and uh, we needed to figure out funding uh, mm -hmm. at that point. And we had just put in uh, like uh, our, our phase one, our first phase one award uh, for the proposal. And at the end of the year, we had $200 left in our bank account. Mm -hmm. And we were just like, you know, is, is, is Santa going to survive anymore, right? right? And, and then um, one week later uh, in the first week of January, we you know, we got our, our, yeah. our first phase one and we had $200,000, $200 in yeah. our bank account, right? And that was more money than we had ever had before, right? right? And we, we had gone through like our first five prototypes with just $5,000 yeah. in funding, right? So it was, it was just like this, this night and day, like roller coaster type yeah. approach, right? And that's, I mean, that's the life of a startup, right? I, yeah. Like going through that. And, uh, and like they were saying too, right? I mean, uh, this kind of vetted for the the, the um, angel investors for yeah. our, our pre-seed round that, that we ended up doing uh, later on. And it was in that sense, it was like a piece of that puzzle, right? Yeah. So it was like, we've got the SBIR who have like vetted this technology, you know, if they, they believe in it, like, like, you know, these are scientists who are doing review panels on this and entrepreneurs who are doing re like reviews of this. And they're saying that this is worth the taxpayers dollars to go into it that helps to convince the, the, um, the, the pre-seed people. And then that just cycle just continues, right? You get investors come in, SBAR grants are easier to get because if they vet it first, then, then the SBAR reviewers are also like, oh, okay. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah, so it's like each one of those pieces fits into this puzzle that you can just keep continuing to yeah. grow cyclically. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I totally hear you on the um, almost running out of money part, right? I, you know. Uh, you know, when I, when I first, uh, you know, joined Reyes, you know, we didn't have a ton of cash and, you know, we just, you know, went straight for grants and like also trying to fundraise during the pandemic, which is awesome. 
Um, you know, so, you know, I would say that, you know, a lot of these grants saved us and then it kind of had this like snowball effect because money attracts money, uh, fun fact. So, um, you know, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, that's, that's why we're all so thankful, right? I mean, SBR dollars are often the first dollar in the company, whether it's SBR or like non-dilutive in general. I don't know for you guys, for you guys, it was non-dilutive that was the first dollar in the bank for, you know, uh, shut that Chuck. Yeah, I would say there was a business competition, like yeah. the Rice Business Plan competition had some sort of in-kind services and a small amount of cash. And then I think there was um, the investor, like the co-founder investments. And I think yeah. then it was uh, SBIR. Yeah. So. Yeah, outside of a very small co-founder investment <laughs> Yeah. at the time. Yeah. yeah. It was basically the, the phase one is what a lot, we probably wouldn't have pursued the project if we didn't get the phase one. Right. And then we were about to go bankrupt before the phase two yeah. B. Yeah. So, yeah. cause we didn't line up funding yet. Right. So, and then we got, then the phase two B kept us, kept the project going. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to keep the lights on, right. Uh, you know, you got to apply for these grants. You get, you got to go fundraise money, you know, all, you know, all, all those sorts of things. Um, so I want to kind of switch gears to, you know, when you actually get awarded, you know, it's a great feeling, you celebrate, you do your research, you know, it goes as planned, doesn't go as planned, it's, you know. Um, then there's this whole thing called an audit, right? So um, I don't know, have, have any of you guys kind of gone through the auditing process yet? I know before phase two, there's an auditing process, you know, uh, that's unlike, you know, the NIH. So maybe if you guys can kind of share what that experience was like you know, what kind of files you had to show, that sort of thing. Because when I say audit to a first time applicant who's like, you know, an academic, they're like, what are you talking <laughs> about? And wait, what is that thing about timesheets that you, what, wait, what is that? So maybe can you guys, you know, share kind of like your audit experience, whether it was before phase two for NSF or, you know, after, you know, $750,000, I think that's the kind of the threshold for NIH land. So for NSF, it's uh, be before you get a phase two or you go through the, the financial mm -hmm. uh, audit process in particular. And uh, what I would highly, strongly, strongly recommend is getting an accountant who is familiar with yes. grants. Yes. And unfortunately, um, again, again, through uh, uh, the, the incubator program at the University of Illinois, we were put in uh, touch with like, you know, bookkeeping services from like Roland Gardner, who, uh, who has done a bunch yeah. of these like for, for many, many companies. And he's still our bookkeeper to this day because he knows how to report this stuff properly to the, the, uh, the uh, you know, the bodies, the, the review panels and, and uh, all the uh, analyses that, that go on there. Um, and so he was able to make sure that, you know, we, we didn't have timesheets before, right? Yeah. And so he was like, okay, you need to, you need to get timesheets because everyone was just like, you know, we're all working like 90 hours a right, week and things right. like that, right? But why do we need timesheets, right? right? right. Um, but no, he's like, okay, you need to start tracking it. You need to start like labeling the job that you're doing. Is it specific to NSF work? Is it like the general and administrative yeah. stuff? And, uh, and um, because of that, like he basically saved like all, uh, uh, like That's us good. from like getting, uh, dinged on that. The other, the other thing that was important about the audits uh, was that um, you can't necessarily take on debt, um, and so we couldn't really do like yeah. uh, like a, an SBA loan or a uh, yeah. or a, a convertible note yeah. um, unless there, there's technicalities that are, are like around those. Um, but uh, because because you can't use taxpayer dollars to pay off yeah. your your own debts, right. right? That's that's what the rule is. Yeah. So uh, because of that, that informed us like before we did our pre seed raise that we did it on a safe, right? Yep. Because we could raise very easily on that. It was very simple, which is what the S stands for, right? Um, and had we had not known those rules because like we didn't have someone knowledgeable uh, on the accounting side, then then we would have been in a bad position. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, Roland and the Fast Sender thing at Deals Company. So uh, you know, Shavan, check. What about you? I mean, uh, have you, both of you gone through the audit process? Was it fun? <laughs> was it like go first? Well, just yeah, I could just back up what what he was saying is uh, is we we did not get well we when we went through we did go through an audit a few times but when we went through it we already had that accountant we had a SBIR certified Moker they're called Moker um, account you know SBIR experts so we already had that account accounting uh, company in place. So when we went through the, our audit, it was, it was very smooth. Um, but we actually, when um, we ran into an accounting issue in the past with the um, SBIR, so that's how we, we learned that like, okay, we got to get someone in, in house that knows what they're doing. Um, so yeah, I would recommend just doing that from the beginning. 
So um, make, make your life a lot easier. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I've heard horror stories about um, some, some other companies who had those problems. Thankfully, we did um, have uh, someone very knowledgeable on our side who uh, informed us about Moker and, um, and we had started using them and, and they basically um, made the whole audit process pretty seamless. Um, I almost forgot we had something like that going on and I was yeah. like, yeah, it's cause it was, it was relatively um, yeah. seamless. Yeah. Oh, Mo Moker? Mm -hmm. M-O-K-E-R, yeah. yeah. But I think oh, the only other thing I could think of is, I don't know if, if Molker does, like some of the, um, like some of the, like the, the team members and making sure you have like their resumes and their contracts. That's something that Molker, they don't really do. I think that comes into play too a little bit yeah. on the audit. Yeah. So there, there's a, a, like, there's some processes, like if you work with a consultant, make sure you have like their, their resume or the um, qualified suppliers and all that. Yeah. They want to make sure. Employer that contracts. Exactly. Or, consulting contracts, those types of things. Yeah, the auditors want to make sure that the people you say you're working with mm -hmm. are really doing the work, right? <laughs> so I know when I was undergoing, you know, my audits for NSF and NIH uh, through Reyes and other companies, I mean, they, it's like, if any of you have um, ever taken out a loan for a house, right? And then you, at, you were asked to submit all these documents, it's like that. Um, and they, they, they've asked sometimes for like, you know, payroll records, employment contracts, like you met, mentioned, Chuck, even consulting letters to verify the rate, uh, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, this, this is taxpayer dollars that's used, used for the grant. So you can understand the scrutiny, the level of scrutiny, you know, during these type of audits. Um, and, um, you know, I guess, how long were your audits? How, how long did it take you? Do you remember a deal for your phase two? So the first phase two only took like, I would say like two months, two to three months. Okay. Um, the second phase two took like eight months. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. Mm. The, and that stuff has been a little bit slow lately. Yeah, yeah. What do you yeah. think the hold of is? I mean, is it like on there, like personnel? Or... Maybe it was like a COVID backup type oh, thing. Like there's just the sheer number of, uh, of awards and like okay. the, the I, I don't know. But uh, okay. yeah, things have been a little bit slower on the grand front. Um, yeah, or at okay. least with NSF. Wow. <laughs> I haven't heard that. That's, that's interesting. You know, Shadow and Chuck, how long were your audits? I think like maybe a few months or so. Okay. I kind of blocked it out. Yeah. Right, same here. I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but maybe about a couple couple months. Right. Yeah. For the, there's like a wave in the beginning. They get their documents and then yeah. they kind of go away for a little bit, but then maybe a couple months. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, kind of, you know, kind of speaking about things that you kind of like put in the back of your mind, right? Uh, do you guys have any like SBIR? horror stories that you can share, whether it happened within your company or maybe, you know, other companies, you don't have to name them, um, that, that you may know about. I mean, I think, you know, so that others, you know, audience here and our folks at home can, can you know, kind of learn from those kind of like watch outs. I mean, and just on this whole topic of, of budgeting, we, we ran into an issue where when we finally did get like the accounting firm involved, they, they, they were concerned there was maybe some issue, like something was done, not like wasn't done correctly. So um, that created like that, that was a horror story because that created a lot of panic and stress. And then, but we had to then go to the, um, again, our, our program manager with the NIH and get approval for a budget change. But it was, um, it was like after, it was kind of like after this issue was identified. So um, fortunately they, they agreed with it and approved. So then it wasn't an issue anymore. So again, that, that's kind of just carrying on that theme of the, um, so, cause you know, you, cause um, even with a phase one, you know, find somebody that has, that understands that and to kind of not have to worry about that. But we basically were, we got into a, an issue where it turned out that if, if they didn't approve it, like we wouldn't have had as much direct funding to fund the research. And we've already made commitments to commercial partners. So it was, it was a, it was a pretty big nightmare, but fortunately it got resolved. Say, uh, all the letters, all the emails that come from NIH or NSF are very official sounding. So even if it's something <laughs> like like a, a form letter, um, you you get it and you're just sort of like, what did I right. I missed you know, like a line on this one thing? And then yeah. it sounds like they're going to stop the funding immediately. Right. And it's really it's um, scary. But again, when you talk to you know the grant management specialist, that's your sort of your uh, contact for those types of issues, like more administrative. Uh, um, questions and things like that. They, they walk you through a lot of those things. 
pretty well. Um, I would say horror story, uh, never submit the day that it's due. Oh my God. <laughs> Cause, uh, yeah. I'm sure you can attest yeah. to this, but, uh, you, as even if you start the morning of, it's like the submission process, just, you, you just have to kind of have all your ducks in a row and it always takes more time than you think. And, um, and it just is well worth doing it ahead of time so that you don't have the stress of like, you know, missing a deadline, for instance, I'm not saying we've missed a deadline, <laughs> but maybe we've missed a deadline and it was not fun. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. You get really, cause everyone's trying to submit on the last day. And so, yeah. um, so it's much slower and uh, not yeah, fun. <laughs> absolutely. If you want an adrenaline rush, yeah. submit a grand <laughs> like that, yeah. <laughs> within an hour before the deadline. And just so we're clear, the deadline, the timestamp is like, you know, where your company is based. So yeah. if you're in Illinois, don't go on California time. You know, it might, something might, you know, bad might happen there. Um, so yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm with you, Shada, in terms of when you get correspondence, from like the NIH or NSF, it's like, you know, I don't know about you, like PTSD to like school, like, oh, it's my teacher or it's my mom, you know, it's, it's, it's just scary. Um, and it looks very official, the wording, even just like the, the language, it's like, it's, it's not, you know, normal. I don't know yeah, how to describe yeah. it. It's just really official. And, and I can, you know, I can uh, see how um, it can be scary. And I, I'll just want to make one point is that during the audit process, you know, um, you know, for phase two for NSF, or, or even if you're considered for work for NIH, um, there's a lot of wait time from the time you submit to the time you hear something. You're like, oh my gosh, you're taking so long. They're so slow. The government's so slow, right? And then they hit you with all these questions and they're like, give it to us by Friday, five, five o'clock or that's it. And then you just you're just like, oh my gosh, you drop everything that you're doing. <laughs> you know, you, you tell people, you're okay, okay, we've got like, okay, admin questions. Okay, okay, you take the, these, you take this one. And then it's just like this mad rush because you got to meet, there's there's no, you know, my dog was sick. No, 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 it's five o'clock, you know, whenever the deadline is, that that sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I guess that's kind of like a horror story, at least as for, <laughs> you know, for, for me, right? That that it's rush, that rush. And then when you get the, you, you kind of get the uh, notification, like the soft notification that the award is coming, then you start to feel better. And then when you get the official award notice, then you're like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Wait, now I have to do the work. So it's just, um, you know, that whole thing starts. So, you know, deal, any horror stories on, on your part? Uh, we, we did get an NIH proposal rejected because our font was half a point too oh small. My God. Um, and it, oh it passed their like, you know, online like like checker oh, thing. And yeah. we didn't find out until like a month later when we got like an official notice I from them. I feel like that's not fair. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so the other thing I would just say is like prepare for not knowing exactly when your the award is going to come. If you, it, yeah. or, um, because uh, our, our start date for our last phase two was supposed to be six months ahead of time, yeah. like be, before we actually got the, yeah. the award. So um, that just can be, it can become a nightmare if you don't have like backup funding that, that you can rely on. Uh, yeah. and, and you might need to like, you know, figure that out and just have, have plans in place because you, you just don't know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, my, 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 my wife learned that the hard way because we were like, you know, we have a family and kids and she's like, well, so are you, are, we, are you guys getting this great? Because we were about to go bankrupt, right? So it's like, yeah, I think it's supposed to start like in June, right? And then it's like one week, it's like, yeah, it's coming in June. Then like the next day, it's like, yeah, I think maybe December, right? Or, yeah. or August or September. Yeah. So like, so um, yeah, just you got to be prepared for that, you know? And, and then just to, cure, just to add on to the font story, yeah. we had one, um, our, our CRP, um, Grant was rejected because of um, one of the resumes had an image uh. in the resume. And by the way, it and to make it even worse, that was a, that same resume with this like picture in it was accepted three or four, five times. It was always accepted. Uh. Yeah. But then this individual had this image in this resume that for some reason the system rejected it. And we asked a program manager and they're just like, it's, it's sorry. So yeah. we had that delayed, uh, the, you know, we had to come back another three months yep. later uh, submit, so yeah yeah i think these you know these uh, uh administrative rules are rules right yeah. and uh i you know maybe i do have a couple horror stories shared not mine in particular but um i know that i think uh for i think it was a, a research strategy maybe for like you know a phase one or phase two doesn't matter but you know there's a page limitation right um and uh you know uh, i think the solicitation said you know no hyperlinks allowed and this guy in his, you know, uh, project description hyperlinked like something, like an article. Like here's the article, thinking that's useful, 
right? You know, uh, I think maybe a few weeks after he submitted this grant that he spent like months working on, someone called him and says, sorry, Charlie, you know, you put a hyperlink in this file and he's like, it's to the paper, right? No, nope. grant was rejected. Wow. So, you know, you know, uh, unacceptable font size margins too. I've, I've heard about margins, um, you know, put, not, not putting in, uh, putting in uh, things that are, that are unallowed. Um, so make sure you read that fine print because there, there's like, I don't know what office it was from, from the NIH, but it's like, that is a big part of their job yeah. is to find those gotchas, <laughs> right? So that's some serious detective work, uh, you know, over and there. I think that's another, like, that's where it's really important. If it's your first one, like find somebody, you know, to even just at least review the, even help with all that, because like I'll meet people that are doing it for the first time. Yeah. And even if like, okay, Hey, they could write a good grant and all that. Like, I'm like thinking in my head, like, good luck with, with submitting it right? <laughs> and all these. Cause you, yeah. So pay yeah. attention to those details. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, just kind of like, you know, giving someone, you know, uh, another set of eyes to look through the yeah. application other than your team is so important. I, I think another horror story is I, I know one uh, person who put the wrong figure in their grant, and it just messed up the flow of their research strategy. And, mm. and it was just like the reviewers kept talking about the figure, like, well, this doesn't match up with the tax. It's so out of place. And she just couldn't believe it. You know, she couldn't, she couldn't believe it. And I think I have just one more horror story to share. And that's um, because I think it's important, you know? Um, uh, I remember, uh, so, you know, the biosketches, NIH biosketches, like, the, you know, the rules seem to, to, at least to me, change often. And there's like a limitation on, you know, things that you can, um, uh, you know, uh, submit like a like number of articles, that sort of thing. I think, I don't know when this was, maybe it was like 2010 or so, Put together a fast track, which you know ultimately got funded. It was like a two point three million dollar grant, but the program officer sent me an email and said, "Doctor So and So's bio sketch has one more citation that's you know that's allowed," and I'm like, "So, what does that mean? Do does it just do it? Is that just a warning?" I, I was just sweating because I was like. <laughs> Okay, you know, this is on me. This is my job to submit. And uh, I was in trouble with my CEO if it was rejected because I missed that little detail on this massive fast track grant. And the program officer was just like, I'm just gonna let this slide. But <laughs> next time, next time it's not gonna go through Annalisa. So I'm like, wow. I'm like, okay. Wow. Like, I saved my job. <laughs> not fired. So, you know, it's good. So just uh, you know, make sure you follow the rules. Um, you know, uh, you know they're there for a reason. Okay. You know, I guess you know. Final question before I go into you know questions from the audience here live or you know you know in the in the virtual world. If you if you can go back in time, you know, quantum leap for you know uh, kind of, and when you're preparing your very first SBR application, what would you have done differently? Uh, I, I would say that. Um... I, I didn't know how much time to budget for it. Um, and I would at least start it like two to three months in advance, um, at least start drafting it. it Cause it's, yeah. it's gonna have to go through many, many revisions, right? To get to a, a good state. And um, that was something that I'd learned, you know, the hard way uh, and, and yeah, start early and, and uh, prepare for revisions. I would say a uh, big thing would be uh, look at the study sections, um, really understand where your, where your tech fits into um, each of the institute's, you know, uh, objectives. Um, and if you, once we kind of found alignment there, that was, it made things a lot easier when it was getting reviewed. You could tell it was like night and day, you know, the first few that either didn't get scored or, um, you know, uh, or got reviewed but not, didn't make the pay line, it, there wasn't really an alignment. And then once it got to the right um, study section, it was really uh, it's great. The panel was great. So it's a good fit. Yeah, I think one, yeah, those are all uh, really good points. And I think that usually that's what we say about three months, you know, like you should give yourself about three months. And then the uh, one thing that I, I think took me some time to realize was, okay, because you, you focus so much on these aims and the commercialization plan and all that, but, but really the, the flow right? And in, in the story element um, and just realizing you kind of hinted on this earlier is where 
okay, like in this case, there was a figure that was wrong. And then, so um, it took me some time to kind of learn this, but um, it's just like, put yourself in the shoes of the reviewer, right? Because, yeah. um, well, first and foremost, you're not there to explain this, right? So they're just handed this, this document and they have to read it. And one thing I didn't realize is that um, if they get confused or if they get um, confused because like you didn't write something, it didn't flow properly or something doesn't like make sense, they, um, they usually like, it just kind of, it's like a snowball effect. So um, they just keep, cause it's right. The, um, the way the scores work is um, right. You get, you get dinged every time they have a comment. So um, making sure that that story is um, just super crisp, you know, from the beginning. So um, um, the way we, the way we've mitigated that risk is um, we always write down our questions. Like if I'm reviewing what someone else wrote or someone's reviewing what I wrote, we write down all our questions um, and then same when we give it to the independent reviewers within our, within our process, we have, you know, we capture all their questions and then how do you, then now you want to try to mitigate, you want to answer all those questions in. So it's like, as you're reading these sentences and, you know, sometimes the lazy thing that says, oh, well, it's answered below it's answered, you know, three pages, but should you start answering it a little earlier, right. And introducing it slowly to the reader in that overall flow, I think like knowing that from the beginning, I think will, um, would help a lot. Yep. I think for me, if I were to, you know, travel back in time and, uh, you know, look at uh, young Padawan and Elisa, um, I would say do not underestimate, um, you know, other sections of the grant, like the budget and how much time that can take. So when I put together my, you know, my first fast track grant, I think I saved that, you know, to the end, maybe a couple hours before the deadline. And I'm like, oh, it's gonna be fine. And then I looked at the file and I almost fainted because I was just like, <laughs> oh no, this is a three-year grant. And then I have to make sure the math is right. And then now I gotta write a budget justification and everything's gotta make sense. Like that budget has to match the rest of the narrative, right? Yeah. So um, if I were to go back in time, I would, you know, pay attention, as much attention to the budget, you know, yeah. as other sections of the grant. Oh, yeah, I know you bring up a good point. I was actually going to touch on that too a little bit is um, that's another, yeah, just all these sections, right? Like the budget and if there's a commercialization plan, um, it's, it's easy kind of going back to the original question about how do you deploy this, right? Yeah. Well, like, even though if you have certain people working on different sections, really try to make sure it's integrated, right? Like if yeah. you're, if in the research, the commercialization, you're saying you're going to do X, Y, Z, or in the, yeah. the research plan, make sure that that aligns with the budget. So yeah, yeah that's a really, really good point. And allocating yeah. time and make sure yeah. if different people are working on it, working like together. Yeah, absolutely. I think just one more point I wanna to make too, for those that are applying, that have clinical trial components, do not underestimate how difficult the human subjects, human research subject, what's the word, yeah. human subjects research <laughs> section is. You got to come up with your like, you know, dissemination plan, enrollment criteria. It is this massive required section. If you're doing clinical trials, do not save that to the end because you will cry. Like yeah. Documents, like anything that you're going to be using during the trial or the enrollment. Like just save them yeah. Yeah. The only, the only, no, that's a, that's a really good point. We've, we've experienced that too. The other, the other thing, um, I didn't realize, um, now we've never successfully uh, done this, but like to go directly to a phase two, we've never actually even tried it yet, but um, just because we happened to start with a phase one for our product, but that's something now we, um, we do help other people with, with grants and whatnot. So that's something I've learned a lot that like, I think going back to the beginning, um, getting like some early feasibility data, right? Like if you have a design or getting some early feasibility data and trying to do a direct to phase two, um, you know, if you have any resources, because otherwise it's, you know, may take you like a year to year and a half to get to that, maybe even two years to get to that phase two. So. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I, I think at this point, I'd like to maybe uh, kind of turn to the audience, um, you know, whether here at Portal or virtually to see if anyone has any questions for, you know, Rockstar panel here. Uh, okay, so Ali asked, uh, you know, how many times have you guys gone through rejections? And I mm. guess, how did you kind of recoup from that? 
I could, I could just, I'll give a quick answer. Uh, phase first time we did the phase one, we got rejected. And then I believe we got on the second one. Phase two, we got rejected the first time, got on the second one. Phase two B, we were, which was the biggest one, we were very fortunate, like we got it the first time. Um, when you get the rejection, it, it, the nice thing is you, they give comments. And then you could decide if like, hey, can we address those comments, right? And then, um, then you resubmit. So that's actually a good point because with the, um, especially like with, especially a phase one, um, sometimes just for speed, you might want to get it out as, instead of, you know, spending, how do I say, if you're coming up against another cycle and you're like, yeah, it's not quite perfect yet. Instead of waiting to the next cycle, three months, you may want to make a strategic decision to get it in so you could get some feedback, knowing that there's a higher probability it's going to get rejected, but get that initial feedback instead of spending three more months trying to make it perfect when they may not like what you already have initially. So the way we usually, um, we did with a CRP grant, um, we got rejected and um, we strategically decided not to resubmit because the comments were just, um, we just didn't think we were gonna be able to address them, so. Next week, we have a workshop June 23rd, specifically about what to do if you get rejected. After you cry. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and importantly, like, uh, you know, we've, we've definitely gotten a lot of, we got a fair share of rejections early on um, and understanding again where the fit is with, within the um, uh, institution. And then also, um, you know, really addressing those comments. And sometimes, unfortunately, um, there will just be one reviewer. It's kind of just like R01s or any other like academic grants. There will just be like that, that one reviewer that really, for whatever reason, doesn't see the, the value, doesn't see the, so even if, Two of them line up, and the other one just sort of doesn't see it. Um, you, it's the luck, a little bit the luck of the draw. So, um, so you really have to try as best you can to put it together and resubmit. Um, you get, I think, one chance for any of them, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm speaking. I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I think for most grants, you get one more chance, and then you have to do a totally different um, proposal. So it can't be the same. So an online. Uh, so one question is, could you please describe the practical logistic side of the auditing process, i.e., who contacts you, what you send back, who you interact with, and how long Okay. Okay. Uh, you maybe just you know briefly, uh, just I guess it's worth repeating since it's so important. I guess uh, uh, you know folks at home are just wondering, you know, kind of like the auditing process. How, how, you know, like, you know, who contacted you, you know, when did they contact you, you know, that, that sort of thing. I personally, I wasn't as involved because it was um, before I had more of a role in the whole grant. Um, and so I might throw this to you. Yeah, I, I can't, I don't have a ton of I, I experience with it neither, just because when we get, we got contacted and then we basically, well, hang on, the audit, um, yeah, then basically we just were like an interface between us and the accounting firm primarily. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I was going to say we're, we were first contacted by the program director who said that you're going to get an audit now. Um, and then it's the, the, they contract an auditing firm that's going to contact you directly. And then that's who they're, they're going to have a list of like files that you need to upload. And then like you send them that package. And then like a month later, they'll get back to you with a bunch of questions. And then you need to just provide evidence for uh, answers for each one of those, those questions. But that's directly with the auditing firm. And then when they sign off on it, then uh, it'll go back to the program director. And that's who you end up talking with again. So keeping, but just, I think a big thing for that too, is just keeping good records, right. Of like all of your like payroll and, and benefits and like whoever your consultants or vendors are the invoices, you know, keeping not just like throwing them away or deleting them, keeping all those invoices and those, those financial records um, that, and making sure it's aligns with the budget proposal that that's, that's going to be key. Yeah. Having a coding process is really important for each of the different categories of the budget. What a plug, Roland Barton, who's one of our consultants yeah. that we can use for the fast track. This is his jam. If he likes working on audit preparation, <laughs> if you get an award, you might want to talk to Roland and the next step so that he can prepare you to be ready for audits. Yeah, you 
we, we love Roland, uh, you know, please contact, uh, you know, Roland Garten, you know, through uh, the FAST Center and hopefully you can work with him. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, they, they are required because if they're going to be depositing money, it has to be into a company itself. So you have to be incorporated before you can even apply it. If, if you go through the application process, you have to say what kind of co corporation that you are, whether it's an LLC or an S Corp or a C Corp or, 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 or not profit or whatever. Um, and then the other thing is that, uh, I mean, you can try to do it, try and get one without any personnel aside from like the PI, but it's going to be really, really challenging to get an SBR with just like one person. Um, and, and that's one of the things that like, you know, you could potentially address it by saying like, you know, part of this, the, the purpose of this grant is to, you know, the, the test the feasibility so we can hire on someone to take care of the commercialization side of things or, or you know, grow up um, that kind of, or hire, or like uh, to run the experiments and things like that. But um, your chances are going to be a lot lower if you don't have personnel on board. Yeah, I wonder what the stats are on the, like if anyone has ever successfully applied just by themselves. Um, I would say the other big part of it is you have to submit a facilities um, and other resources uh, document and that, really has to establish that you have an ecosystem available to you. So like, let's say, you know, you're a member here, or you're, you know, you have to really show that there's a support uh, network around you and, um, and that you'll be able to accomplish what you're saying you're gonna accomplish. And it can't all be just sort of pie in the sky. It has to be pretty um, you know, reliable and, and physically present. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that, that. That's what I was going to add. And then the, um, but yeah, even if it's only like one or two employees, the um, the consultants, and I forget the term for it. Is it the special or key key members on the personnel. key personnel? Yeah, key, yeah. key personnel, right? So that like. I would highly suggest, you know, you, you got to find some people like that it will be key personnel, I would recommend. I think just one point I want to make. So, uh, you know, one of the missions of the SBR program is job creation. So, you know, it's important to, you know, these agencies um, and, you know, just, you know, the, the government overall that, you know, that there are people on payroll. Uh, that a that you actually have a physical space where you do work that you own and control that that sort of thing or a rent, um, but you have to control it. Um, you know that that is part of the mission: job creation, economic development. You know that sort of thing. Any other questions that we have online? No. Oh wait, one more, one more live here, Ali. Uh, you guys, uh, yeah. Great, great question, Lee. So uh, for those of you who can hear, um, he's asking about a topic I love slash hate, and that's customer discovery. I mean, I love it. I mean, it's just a lot of work. Um, but so he wants to know kind of, you know, what was your, your process for customer discovery? Um, so the for me, constantly, we are constantly doing customer discovery. Um, and that, that started from day one to like, to like even today, right? Um, and for us, I mean, we, we made like um, a substantial like, change in our product itself um, based on that process. When we started, it was just like, you know, we were 3D printing our hands and we were like, you know, we're gonna save the world by making these like, you know, $50 the 3D printed bionic hands, right? And then when we actually started talking to hundreds of patients and clinicians, the number one thing that every single patient and clinician said was that their $50,000 bionic hand that was injection molded with custom machine steel was breaking within weeks. You give them a 3D printed hand, it's going to break within minutes, right? So it wasn't necessarily even the cost that was like the biggest issue, it was the durability. And so that forced us to completely think in an entirely different way. How could we build something that leveraged the low cost manufacturing of 3D printing, but still made this hand more robust than anything else that was out there, right? 
and and with little budget, right? So uh, instead, what we instead of three D printing the components, we would three D print molds and use like low cost silicones that would make the hand super durable, like our own fingers are. And it forces us to think outside the box and, and kind of approach this problem. But had we had not done that customer discovery pro or like like exercise, we would not have figured that out and really honed in on what the pain points of our customers actually are, as opposed to what we think they are, uh, which is most of the time wrong. Yeah, I have uh, actually a very similar um, point to make. So um, first of all, I, was, I first came to Brightseed uh, under that umbrella of going out and talking to surgeons and making sure that this was, you know, something they would use and something they needed. Uh, the technology really had that need. Um, and then luckily through NIH, and I don't know if it's come up in any of the other sessions you, you've done, but they have a program called the i um, And you actually go in and it was between phase one and phase two of our grants you interview a hundred stakeholders and, and they, um, they train you sort of how to go about this process and really understand the types of questions you should be asking and the type of, uh, you know, to get outside of your own bubble of everyone around you thinks this thing needs to be made this way, but you really have to listen to the customers. And, um, and with us, it's, it was pretty straightforward. It's surgeons. Surgeons have a, a relatively good sense of what they want and what they definitely don't want, right? And so um, so we did pivot a little bit in terms of, um, you know, initially we were just thinking blood vessels would be the first, uh, you know, the first technology. And we realized there's, there are a couple other ones that are a lot more um, sort of uh, really need to have first, right? And so, um, and, and I think it, it helped open our eyes a little bit to, to some of the issues um, that are fires versus just sort of would be great, would be nice to have, would be really helpful, but these are like needed, needed, you know? Yeah, that's, that's a really, really good, couple of really good points there. The, um, I know for, for us, the, um, but so you like, I like your answer too. And what you're mentioning, like it never ends, yeah. right? It's not like just one point in time, which I'm sure, you know, um, and then the, um, there's two really tricky things. Um, cause you're going to, you could get so much data, right? So I think, um, well, first is, the different value streams, like within the medical device space or even pharmaceutical med tech, right? There's all these various customers, right? I mean, primarily like your case, it's the surgeon. For us, it's the dialysis technician that's actually using the device. Um, they want it to be, like in our case, they want it to be easy to use. But then there are like the nurses who are supervising the operation and they have their, their needs. Um, and then, but then you also have to look at like the management of the hospital and um, the physicians and the, the payers, the purchasing organizations, and each one of them have um, different requirements and there's going to be a lot of conflicting requirements. So um, like in our case, uh, the technicians want something that's easy to use. Um, the physicians want something that's gonna like reduce adverse events and save lives. Um, and the, um, but maybe like the purchasing group, they need it to cost the same amount as an existing product, right? Where what we did wrong in the beginning, we would, we'd ask like the doctors, the physicians, like, oh, what would you pay for this? Oh, wow, they'll pay X amount. Everyone was so excited. But then when you start asking different people, like the payers or the purchasing organizations, so integrating all those, but even within each level, right? Like, let's say just in our case, dialysis technicians or for you surgeons, um, you're going to get so many conflicting requirements. You're not going to know what to do. Like, and it drove me nuts for so long. Cause you think you get some good data, then you talk to someone else and that just, there's a lot of conflicting data. So you want to prioritize, which are the most critical features. Um, the other thing we did that really helped us streamline it is out of all those uh, customers who are the biggest decision makers, right? And if you could find those, in, in our case, we have some large, there's some large commercial um, people like groups and, and we, we got to like who the, the, the users and decision makers within those companies um, that could kind of help you streamline where to put your limited resources and who to ask, right? And to kind of, you know, get a little more um, weighted feedback. But yeah, it's a good question. I know I'll just, I'll say really quick on for us. Um, we said that we did it. 
we actually put quotes like we probably put like maybe five or six quotes you know from like that that were really nice and then added a um a letter from a patient yeah i, I would second that um we had quotes and we said exactly how many people we interviewed over what yeah. what point in time um and, and for those of you at home who couldn't hear the question, the question was, you know, how did you, I guess, provide evidence? How did you show that you actually did customer discovery? And I guess, uh, you know, uh, my, my response to that um, is that, you know, when I put together a grant, I actually have a section called customer discovery. And I say, you know, the type of stakeholders that we talk to, what, you know, kind of the, uh, you know, value propositions, um, you know, were important to them, that sort of thing. Because I think, you know, for customer discovery, the main thing, one of the main things is to understand the pain points for each of um, you know, the stakeholders because those pain points translate into value propositions, which then translate into things that your technology can, you know, uh, you know, can, can do in terms of uh, filling in gaps and those help, can help inform your objectives or specific aims. I just, I just had one more yeah, sure, so sure, just sure. Uh, on the technical side of that um, of course you want to find those key stakeholders and like interview them like open-ended interviews right but if you do want to do like surveys the one thing we found to, to kind of streamline it is we used us I think survey monkey oh, yeah we use yeah. survey monkey and then we found on Facebook we found certain groups like for us in particular in the dialysis for patients we found a, a, a literally it's a page called I hate dialysis and there's thousands of patients. Um, and then we talked with the administrators and they, um, they let us like launch these surveys and we would instantly get all this data like through these surveys. So survey monkey and Facebook groups uh, helped us streamline that a lot. You know, I know we're up on time here, um, but you know, I think uh, you know uh, the four of us here can talk about SBRs all day um, because it's so near and dear to our heart, and it saved our company, uh, kept the lights on, uh, etc. But um, you know, thank you so much, Chuck, Sheva, Adil. Let's give them a round of applause. These guys are awesome, uh, and and I can't wait to see your technologies out in the market because I'm going to say I know the people behind that one. I know the people behind that one. So we're you know cheering you on, and and thank you so much, everyone, for you know joining here and. For for the folks at home and then next week is um you know the last uh, session um and that will fo focus on you know you know uh, kind of like uh what to do when you get rejected and it happens right uh, you know there's a there's a you know kind of light at the end of the tunnel that sort of thing don't give up hope and um so that so that's next week so you know please register for that and with that you guys have a great rest of the day go submit a grant go get you know get some help from the fast center and we'll see you soon thanks so much